behavior change isn't, you know, that's always the, the, the tough part. But I think in a room like this where you're speaking to the converted, you, you've got to kind of ask yourself, so what can we do? And it really does all start within our immediate sphere to go out and drive that change and, and ripple out. Um, but I want to start maybe, Mark, with you. And, you know, working with an NGO, you know, coming from a corporate background, and you realize how much of these projects are often just driven on the whiff of an oil rag, probably a bad metaphor to use at a, a <laughs> sustainability conference, but, uh, and on the back of one individual who's really passionate. How do we scale that? You know, how, how do we take um, you know, one Terran and make another hundred? How do we systemize that? Because while the work you're doing is amazing, there is a need for another hundred, another thousand Terrans. How should we be thinking about helping this project scale? Okay, oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned an oil rag. I mean, I think I drive Land Rovers and uh, <laughs> they drop oil everywhere. <laughs> so I realise that Land Rovers have been had an environmental policy for many, many years. They're putting the oil slowly back into the earth everywhere where it came from. <laughs> but in, in jest, the Land Rover was developed out of necessity at a time after the wars uh, for farmers in Europe that needed a, a vehicle where there was no sh metal around, there was no materials, but there was an abundance of aluminium <laughs> left over from an aircraft and, uh, and the war. And I think we're facing a similar stage here where we've got a product that is mounted and created around the planet, and certainly your presentation, I'm familiar with the, the work you do, um, highlights the scale of this. So I think the scalability comes from the fact that from one Taran making awareness and actually choosing to take a step forward. She's learned an amazing amount. She didn't come from an academic background of what she's doing. She's out there putting it and making it happen. But across the city, we have many, many water warriors. In Alex, there's 250 uh, volunteers that have been working for two years since the World Water Day two years ago. Um, predominantly unemployed people. And, but as I said earlier, unemployed doesn't mean they're unskilled, unwilling, and unable. And if you can provide resource, but I love what you said, to provide machinery and plant, is an, is an order process, but it has to have a return on investment. And I think what we're hearing here is that waste has value. It has an ability to find itself back into either... There's two ways to make money. You either sell more or you reduce your costs. Mm -hmm. And you need to do both. And we need to do that both sustainably. So for me, it's the fact that NGOs actually are a very important pillar. You know, Oxfam, Save the Children are not small operations and they pay their staff very well. In this country, most of the NGOs, if there's any present today here, are doing it for volunteer. Whereas virtually everybody here is being paid to sit here. And I think that's a critical thing. I, I have to be careful in both corporate and government circles when I say that, but often we are in government organizational functions or meetings and mm. we point out we're here volunteering to be here, volunteering to be here. So paying people and I know that if Taryn and others were paid to do what they're doing, and it's not picking, being paid to pick up the litter, I think your point was so valid. People think, oh, throw it down. I, and I do think people thought that for a long time. I think we're getting past that now. It's not a, you couldn't possibly throw down enough litter to create enough jobs. But ironically, there's a lot of litter out there. Yeah. And therefore, if we can just think differently, it is scalable. Uh, Londiwe, from a PRO perspective, you know, what can the PROs in the room do to help a wastepreneur like yourself to ensure that we don't have the many failures that you spoke about earlier on? Oh, oh yes. Um, when it comes to the um, PROs, uh, the, the, you know, with the new the, the legislation, uh, the EPR legislation, I do think that there is an opportunity for the EPR to be able to motivate more uh, collectors or for the, the waste premiers to be able to do more work uh, at the ground. Uh, because the biggest uh, challenge when it comes to uh, motivating people to do the work or when it comes to, uh, you know, as a buyback center in the township, when the value of recycling is high, you get there in the morning, there's a long queue, 
people uh, are wanting to bring recyclables, people are willing uh, to do the work and to separate. But as soon as you then remove value from the whole exercise, uh, then it becomes a problem. So I think the PROs need to really come in to say how do they put, how do they ensure that recycling does not lose value all, all together so that people do not become demotivated mm -hmm. uh, to, mm -hmm. to collect. And it, and it ties back to what Chandru was saying yesterday also about, you know, when you think of down weighting, you know, you've got to consider all of these factors that, uh, that really are experienced by uh, the waste pickers on the ground. Uh, there's a great question from Avashni here at San Freepol, Nicholas, and uh, I must say it's fantastic to see the work that the Alliance has done launching when you did, and I recall, uh, you know, when you did launch, little did we know what, what was going to happen just weeks afterwards mm. with the world going into lockdowns and COVID. So to look at what you've achieved actually through that period and, and given those headwinds is, is truly remarkable. Now, you, you've obviously piloted many projects around the world and uh, Vashi wants to know, just to get a sense of um, whether or not the viability of some of these projects has been demonstrated in terms of them becoming now self-funding uh, and, and self-sustaining. Indeed, I think there's been a tremendous learning over these last few years, and one of the things that we've kind of pivoted towards is working more in a private sector space, because it's recognized that um, if it's going to be self-sustaining, the economic viability has to be there, uh, and, and of course then it's, it's a private enterprise that's going to probably make that happen. Uh, in the earliest days, I think when the Alliance launched, there was this view that we need to work with more with NGOs, and we need to fund uh, organizations that are are going to be doing that basic work on the ground um, in the collection space. Uh, I, I think we had a lot of engagements with multilateral organizations and with other, other organizations as well. And they had a lot of, um, I would say, the hearts were absolutely in the right place. They were working hard and, and well-meaning. Um, but it, it really is that economic viability that's going to drive it and that business ethos that's going to make it, make it work. So we've actually moved more towards, uh, in the last, I would say, year and a half uh, supporting a lot more private enterprises with uh, the systems that are going to come into play. And that doesn't mean we're not supporting community collection efforts, but we want that to be tied with a, with a mindset that is ensuring that value is going to be derived from that waste collection, that they're going to be looking for efficiencies and scale in getting the volumes in, in order that they can sell it and, and that the recyclers are going to be um, wanting to work with them. Uh, and ideally that we're also then supporting those recyclers. So there's been a few models like that where uh, we see it working. Um, I'll be going actually next week to, to Nairobi uh, on actually Sunday night. We're going to be seeing uh, Takataka Taka Solutions, which is a, an effective recycler in Nairobi. They're doing the hard stuff as well. They're doing flexibles, films, and so on. And we've seen that their business works, and we want to fund their expansion. So we did a, a short project with them last year to just kind of get to know each other and support them in... Uh, working with the informal sector that's uh, working on the Dandora landfill in the center of Nairobi, uh, providing PPE, um, giving them some equipment, some trucks, and so on. Uh, but now we're doing a much larger project because there's absolute investability in, in, in a new sorting line and a new recycling line for films and flexibles. So we're going to see them actually be ramping up significantly the, the economic viability of their, their project because it works. They've come up with a model that, that is, is effective balancing and, and engaging the informal sector, but then having a commercial orientation. So if, it, if it's going to earn money, it's going to solve the problem at the end of the day, right? So we need to make sure yeah. we're supporting those, those solutions that are going to uh, bring value into the system uh, and the economic viability. I want to open up, I think we've just got time for one question from the floor. Uh, well, it was you. you've been sitting on that question the whole morning, haven't you? <laughs> some fastest hands in the air first. Just a reminder to please introduce yourself. Testing one, two, there we go. Mm -hmm. uh, we run a project, uh, thanks to Safrapol. We educate 90,000 young people in schools in every province in South Africa. We bring them into cinemas. We educate them about entrepreneurship and the green economy so they understand about climate change. This is in probably in 700 schools. Uh, then they enter a competition uh, to start a business in the green economy. And hopefully, uh, we, we bring about 500 little companies in school 
all over South Africa. Mm -hmm. And some of those companies are in the circular economy, some in the sharing economy, some are in plastic waste, and then we have the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, and quite frankly, we could very easily move this whole process into plastic waste, and there must be a way that we could work together. Uh, last year, uh, we, we had uh, Safripal come to the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. This year, we're hoping to uh, give them the key award for innovation. But have you ever used the school system? Could you cooperate with us? And basically, I think we could achieve a great deal if we collaborated. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes and yes, right? So the uh, <laughs> the school system is obviously the key. So we've had a couple of experiences there. Uh, we've worked with an organization called Soseo. Uh, it's a German NGO that's operating mainly in India, and we've set up a uh, an education uh, system there called uh, the Change Makers, and um, it's incredible what they've accomplished. So it's in in the Calcutta area of India, uh, in the rural areas outside the main city of Calcutta, and um, these change makers, these students, like 40,000 students uh, across uh, this area have been involved in this program. So there's a, there's a teaching and learning manual that was created. They, they have online video um, things that, uh, that have been used in the classrooms to kind of educate the kids around what needs to be done and what they can do. And they send them out in groups to the markets, actually, and there's some fantastic footage of these schoolgirls and, and schoolboys who are in the market uh, going up to some of the stallholders and, and, and talking about what kind of materials they're using for bags, right, and to, to sell their fruit and vegetables and, and, and encouraging people to obviously bring their own bag if they can, but also talking about uh, littering and, and, and so on and, and waste management. So great example there. Another one we're doing with Plastic Bank in Bali, uh, again, at the school. Um, we're trying to ramp it up to about, uh, uh, I think it's about 20 schools across Denpasar. Um, and this one is more about getting the kids to bring their recyclables in and they have a, 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 a PET bag, they have a, a rigid polypropylene bag, and they have another bag and a few others. So they're actually getting the kids to source segregate at school the different materials. And then Plastic Bank is coming and collecting and bringing it to their sorting center and bailing it. But again, there's a huge education component that's happening in the classroom. So these are, these are absolutely critical. And, and when we talk about our Bursi Indonesia program, that is one of the key elements. Uh, we have to be in the schools because it's, yeah. it really starts with the children. Um, so yeah, let's talk because as we ramp up to large-scale activities here in South Africa, we need that school program element to be coming in as well. Um, and I'll, I'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Emmanuel there because we can maybe uh, have a triangular collaboration. I think you've found lunch partners. Uh, yeah. Mark, <laughs> last comment and then we'll try. Yeah, I think we've heard a lot today about behavior change and awareness, but reaching to schools, as you heard earlier, with, with the work Taryn does and, and, and has just been discussed, I think is critical. But I, I think I'd break it into two, two things. One is... A lot of people grow up through an old school system that says, I want to be a teacher to fix this. I want to be a doctor to help people. And only when they get there, they find that that's not what it's all about. You know, I think there's a 50% dropout rate at, at universities because of that, that challenge. So reaching into schools and with your project is fantastic. So we do talks at schools. It's about the awareness, but it's then linking it to this clear understanding that how do you make it a, a social capitalist model, a business model that allows you to help whilst making money, and money's not the evil thing, it's what you do with the money, creating value out of these industries. There's billions of potential dollars in the waste industry to be made. I mean, I, and, and we've got an example here that we did a thing with schools recently. So that's a bar of chocolates. I'm, no one's going to tell me to stop eating chocolate. Maybe I'll cut back on the sugar, but it's, it's knowledge. But that's a bar I ate and then it gets turned into my wallet. So what we're trying to do here is now encourage schools to start, find the entrepreneur that puts their hand up and says, hey, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then you create it in that school and allow them now to bring their packets directly to home and then feed it through to programs uh, either in townships. So in this instance, you've got people sitting in townships that have got sewing machines waiting for someone to say, come and fix my shoes. What we'd rather do is get this factory now to make the panels, make up the designs, deliver this to the person in the township. He assembles, keeps some to sell to tourists, and takes others back to a central retail hub. But this allows it to be removed at source before it gets into the system. Um, so I think that's the one. The other is awareness, and just listening to your, your last 24, 48 hours, coming to visit places and going to Nairobi and seeing it firsthand is the best education you can have. 
<coughs> this trip we've just done across Africa, that's one of the purposes, was to go and see what's being done across the continent. The second half of this trip takes part in June. What we'd like to do is find somebody who would be willing to come and help sponsors, say, one of the water warriors that has been earning their way by hard volunteer work in the middle of a township and see them come and visit Uganda, Rwanda, or where they ban plastic bags and see the rivers that don't have any waste in them. And just by going on that for a week, for the cost of a ticket and the accommodation, we'll do everything else. I think that person will come back and be a different change maker within the South African environment. Yeah. And we do it in corporate space, but if we can give opportunities to those individuals to step out of their environment to come back. People in South African townships have been born and brought up there now. That is their home. And whether it's a township in Alex or if it's in the middle of a fancy golf estate, that is the environment they know. And the floodwaters and the erosion and the plastic is happening to everybody, whether you've got a 10 million rand house and you wake up and now there's a sandy beach full of rubbish in front of you. Yeah. That is what is happening. And we need to realize we are linked more by the things that are common as opposed to the, the differences that keep us apart. So. Fantastic thoughts. And I think just to end off on that point, uh, uh, a warm round of applause, everyone, for our panelists and for all of our speakers.